hello there. Hi, everyone. Oh, it's so good to be back here today. I, I tell you what, I have traveled literally thousands of miles to be with you. Thousands, yes, yes, thousands of miles. Because I, I flew from Los Angeles uh, just yesterday, yesterday evening. And, um, oh, it was quite the adventure. As I had to go through Charlotte, and my flight was delayed, I didn't get home until 1.30 in the morning. Yeah, yeah. And I live way out in the country. Yes, yes. So, but as I look at your smiling faces, it's all worth it. It's worth it to be here with you. How you doing? Did you have a good week? Yeah, yeah, you had a good week? You look like you did. Well, um, I'm back this weekend, and Delilah, thank you so much. We missed you last week. And by the way, some of you were not here last week. And I just want you to know we missed you. We missed you. And I'm glad that you're here today and that we can come and learn together. I think that is going to be a blessing just to learn. Um, by the way, there's some things that I have to let you know that I let people know last week so that we're all clear. I'd like for us to move together on one accord. You understand? And uh, one of the things that I made clear last week was that I don't come here to tell you what to eat. Okay? So many of you can relax. Some come here begrudgingly and they say, well, he's just going to tell us to stop eating the things I like. But I want you to know you'll be very disappointed because I don't do that. In fact, I come here just to tell you about, uh, you hear me say this a lot. You may not like a plant-based diet. You may not love it, but it certainly does love you. You may not love your collards. You may not love the kale. You may not love beans. I don't know what kind of person would not love beans, but they certainly do love you. And that's what I want to share with you today. That's really the heart and soul of what I share. I show that you, first and foremost, you are amazing people. You are fearfully and wonderfully made incredible. I mean, when you sit down and just consider who you are and how you are designed and made, oh, it just gets you excited. I got to calm down. Let me calm down with the story. You know, last week I said I had two really good stories, right? Yes, last week I told that one. I'm going to tell you the second one. You like stories? Okay. And, and it'll, it'll set the stage for where we're going. Now, there was a couple a couple, husband and wife, and they were sitting down at a marriage retreat. How many of you are married here? Have you been to one of those? Well, they were at a marriage retreat, and all of the other couples, they were so amazed by what was shared. It was learned that in 50 years of marriage, they had had only one argument. Anybody here can say that? I know you can. Um, 50 years of marriage, they only had one argument, right? And all the couples were like, whoa, wait a minute. We've got to hear the story of why in 50 years you only had one argument. So the husband told the story. He said, oh, there we were. Young honeymooners there on this beautiful, romantic, tropical island. And we decided, we decided, let me give you some visuals to support what I'm saying. He said, we had decided that we would go horseback riding on the beach. And my wife had a nice, beautiful horse. I had a beautiful horse. And there we trotted along. And my horse was very agreeable. Just went where I told her to go and just was very pleasant. But hers was a rambunctious, rambunctious horse. You know, bucking and moving and doing what he wanted to do. And... As they went along, he was telling the story. Her, hus her horse bucked on, him, on her, and she got off of the horse. She walked around to the side of the horse. She grabbed it by its, yeah. She looked it right in the eyes, and she said, now that's one. She got back on the horse, and she went along. Went a few more feet, and then the horse bucked again. What do you think she did? She got off of the horse. She walked around to the side, looked at it in its eye, grabbed by its bridle, 
And she said, now that's two. She went back around, got back on the horse, and she knew that that was it, but she went a little further. And guess what? That horse did the same thing. It started to move this way and stop and go. And she got off of that horse. She pulled out a gun that her husband didn't know she had, and she shot and killed the horse. The horse fell dead. And that's three. Her husband was like, what? in the world just happened. He said, woman, have you lost your crazy mind? Do you know we're going to have to pay for this horse? What is wrong with you, woman? She said, now that's one. <laughs> and they never had an argument again. Moral of the story, a living husband is better than a dead horse any day. Now, please understand, as I share with you today, we won't have any arguments. Because I will let you know by signaling, now that's one. No, I won't do that. Well, we won't have any arguments because I think what I share with you, you will find to be pleasant, you will find to be helpful. And you're smart people made in the image of a loving, kind God. And therefore, you're smart people and the information I share, you will be able to discern. You'll say, that's good information. I won't have to try and persuade you because a man persuaded against his will is of the, help me out now, of the same opinion still. Now, last week I had to do this throughout my presentation because did you all have a potluck today? Did you? Yeah, was it good? Yeah? Did you eat to the full? Were you blessed? It doesn't matter because physiology says that since you have eaten the blood in your head, it's going to move down to your stomach and your head will follow it and you will start to go to sleep. So therefore, I will ask you certain questions just to make sure you're tracking what I'm saying so that we're all moving together on one accord like a Honda. Is that all right? All right. So now I read this. This was a gentleman that I have a lot of respect for, a doctor. He's down in Houston, Texas. His name is Baxter Montgomery. And Baxter Montgomery, he said something I thought was very profound as we get started today. He said, poor nutrition trumps tobacco, alcohol, and sedentary lifestyles as the primary cause for the development of chronic illnesses. Wow. Trumps alcohol, tobacco, and sitting around on your couch. We cannot ignore the reality that what we eat is totally within our control. And our choices are what determine the level of risk we have of becoming ill. I thought that that was, the thing that really struck me about that was that it's worse than smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol, or just sitting around all day. Now, here, Power of the Seed is my presentation to you today. And I want us to understand four things. Four things I'm really going to share with you in this presentation. Four things I will share with you, and then I will say thank you very much, and maybe take a few questions. The first thing we want to do is we want to define what is a seed. What is a seed? The second thing we want to do is we want to look at the types of seeds. You probably had some for lunch today or for breakfast. The third thing is to look at the benefits of seeds. That's where we'll take a look at the science. Any scientists here? Doctors, nurses, doctors, nurses. Medical people, where are you? Well, you'll appreciate the signs, you know? So we'll do that. And then we'll look at the greatest need for what? The greatest need for seed. The greatest need for seed. Now, what is a seed? What is a seed? What is a seed? Anybody? Organism? I'm doing this because you're half sleepy. I know what it is, and I have the answer on the next slide. <laughs> but I want to know what you think. Something that grows. Ooh. Huh? So the seed has DNA. Did you hear that? Wow. Yes, sir. Biologists. The 
written instructions. Oh, we're getting deep now. Getting deep now. All right. So let's look at, let's, you know, I always like to give sort of a dictionary definition so that everybody knows we're on the same page. Now, I, the first thing I would point out is seed is both a noun and a verb. Right? So we, we realize, as the gentleman said, you know, that it is basically something that when fertilized will produce another life. It has a coating over it, and it has all this DNA, this genetic coating and information inside of it. That's a seed, right? The small, hard-like, very simple de definition, the small, hard-like, seed-like fruit of plants such as wheat. I think it's interesting that it uses wheat as an example. Because how many of you like bread? Come on, y'all. Bread, love bread. Love, love, love bread. So a wonderful article this past week, and they ranked the top 20 types of bread that we should eat. Anybody remember what kind of bread? And I never told anybody last week not to eat bread, did I? But we did have a little mantra. We had something to remind us of what kind not to eat, right? Anybody remember what that was? White bread, but do you remember? The whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead, right? So that was what we shared last week. But here in the definition of seed, it says that it is, you have to get your basically your bread. If you're going to make good bread, it's made from berries, wheat berry seeds. Yeah, yeah. And then the verb is to sow and to, 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 to sow a seed, to put it out into the field, to scatter a seed, right? That's a clean definition. Now, here's a definition I like to use. Now, on your left, you see a seed. I believe that is a, no, that's not, that's a rock, isn't it? You see on your left a rock, and on your right, you see a seed. And I believe that's a pumpkin seed. I like the way it has some information scribbled on it, like the gentleman said back here. It has written information on it. Now, now if you take that rock, right, you take that rock and you put it in some water, you put it in some soil, add some water, will it sprout another rock? Why not? It's full of minerals. I tell you, healthy minerals too. I don't recommend eating them. But it is full of minerals. Now, why won't it sprout a plant and then another rock? Ah, oh, it doesn't have instructions. So no DNA in the rock? No DNA in the rock? It's missing something. It's missing a very key ingredient, a key component, right? Now, let's look over at the seed on the right. Put that in the water or soil. Will it sprout? Why will it sprout? It has minerals just like the rock, but it has that other ingredient, which is vitamins. Vitamins. And vita, vita, is the Latin root word for life, right? It's the word for life. So it has minerals and it has life, right? So one could say that a seed possesses within its casing life. How many of you are longing for the best life? A healthy life? Eternal life? Ah, oh, there are those hands. Right. So the seed gives us a glimpse. It projects somewhat to something that's greater than itself. All of the genetic information to reproduce another life is there. Oh, people say to me all the time, they say, this guy talks about seeds a lot. Do you just eat seeds like a bird? You eat like a bird. And I say, yeah, they can fly. Can you? I don't know about the rest of you, but I plan at some point, I plan to fly. How about you? Oh, y'all don't seem too excited about it. I'm excited about it. <laughs> now, so what we see then, seed equals what? Life. It has within itself life. Again, we're talking about the power of the seed. The power of the seed. Now, this is something that's amazing. Check this out. This is a seed. Have you ever watched and you're driving down a highway or a road, you look down and you see that us under the most 
impossible conditions, somehow there is a plant that has come out of a dry ground. It has come out of the most unusual of places, right? Look at this. I had to grab this video. This is a time-lapse recording of a seed sprouting, germinating. Notice that its roots go down first. It secures itself into the earth in which it is growing. It is grabbing hold to make sure that its foundation is sure before it begins to present life to the rest of the world. It is shooting down into the earth and holding on, but notice the rocks are much heavier than that sprout, but yet it has power to remove them so that it may present its life to the world. Is that not amazing? I want to make sure that you understood that I'm not here because I'm excited about botany. I want to make sure that you understand that I do appreciate a good film and I do like time-lapse time photography and so forth, but that's not why I'm showing you this. I want you to understand today that there's power in the seed. There's power in the seed and you ought to grab hold of the seed. Are you with me so far? You tracking this? Look at that root system down into the earth right there. That's gravel, but it'll use it if it's got some water. But those rocks could not hold it down. Now, last week I looked at five defense systems. How many? Five. Five defense systems to help you stay healthy. And the first one was angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is a fancy word which simply means that in the human body, in your physiology, when you need blood vessels, the body's going to produce them. From the time when you were conceived, your body started producing blood vessels, right, to feed the organs because all of the good nutrition, the oxygen, and everything you need is in the blood. So therefore, your body has to produce blood vessels. And that process of producing blood vessels, capillaries, and so forth, is called angiogenesis. Now that's going to make a whole lot of sense in just a few moments, and even more sense as we talk about what is anti-angiogenic when we look at my third and final presentation, which is called or titled Collards and Kale, a Love Story. You don't want to miss that. But we're going to talk about anti-angiogenic foods. But that's the first one. Angiogenesis is the first thing. The second one is Regeneration, that's stem cells. Everyone's excited about stem cells now. Stem cells, stem cell therapy, and different types of procedures that you can get using stem cells. And stem cells are simply the cells within your body who haven't decided what they're going to be, right? But they're so necessary. They're so absolutely necessary because whatever you need, that's what they become. Skin your leg, get a cut, and you need more tissue, guess what? The stem cells that are there in that region will decide we need to become tissue for the knee. And the moment that happens, angiogenesis comes and says, oh, there's new tissue. Let's give it some blood. I tell you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Are you hearing this? Oh, I tell you, friends, I don't look at these things from a scientific standpoint, even though they're very scientific. I look at it and I say, wow, this is amazing. This could not have evolved. Because it, this took millions of years where we see such love in the human body. Where is that love in our society? Should not it have evolved with it? It speaks to me of a body that was designed from the beginning to do a certain thing. And yet we are in a constant state of degeneration. But our body still shows and reflects a loving designer with me? Oh, I've not come to tell you what to eat. I've come to tell you about the one who told you to eat. To tell you about the one who designed you and also had in mind a purpose for what you eat based on the design. You know, when God made the human body, he did something right before that. I shared this last week, but it bears repeating. God did not make a man 
and then design a menu. See, I like to look at what God does. And then I like to look at or ask the question, why'd you do that? And then I go and study it out. I look into science. I look into history. And I certainly look into the word. And then I begin to see, oh, there was a reason behind this. So what I shared last week was that the fact that God trusted Adam to name or help him to name the animals. Even though, contrary to cradle roll and what we've been taught, Adam did not name the animals. He helped God because God has always known what the animals' names were. Come on, y'all. I was doing one meeting somewhere in Phoenix, Arizona, and a woman got hot as fish grease with me. She said, wait a minute. I've always known that Adam named those animals. I said, do you really believe that a human being that was just made by God, who then actually took from the same dirt and made the animals, he didn't know their names? How can we trust in a God who says, I know the end from the beginning, but yet he didn't know that? Are you with me? So God trusted Adam to name the animals with him. He trusted him to name his wife even before sin. And then after sin, he also trusted him to name her again. First it was just woman, then he named her Eve. But yet, he did not trust Adam to decide what would be on his menu. Did you catch that? So it must be something important about the menu. But take it a step further, there must be something even of greater importance about the body that is to receive that menu. Are you with me? Oh, let's keep bringing this thing home. So, we must understand that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that God has designed the body, and he has a perfect food that stimulates angiogenesis, that stimulates regeneration of stem cells, stimulates your immune system. Give me a food that is good for your immune system. Do you know one? Anybody? Carrots? What was that? Tangerines. Ah, oh, I love tangerines. You can use my weak spot. There you go. Got one right there. <laughs> what else? Broccoli. See, you find that most of your fruits and vegetables that are high in vitamins A, C, and K, and other things, they are good for the immune system, right? Vitamin C, you know, when you catch a cold, you start to store up on lemon juice, or something like that, right? These things are good, yes, high in vitamin C, good for the immune system. So, so I want us to understand, if we're just looking, listen, listen, listen. If we're looking for something to help us out when we get a cold, why not look more widely? Why not look more in depth at so many other things that might be doing something to bring us that health and that life that we all said that we want, right? Then we've got the microbiome. That's new science that looks at the gut bacteria, the ecosystem of the gut, and how it also loves the diet that was given in the beginning as we looked at the original um, diet last week. Now, do you know what foods that are good for the microbiome? Again, that's the gut bacteria or the ecosystem that's found in the gut. Anybody know something is good? Fermented things. Now, fermented things are probiotic, and that's true, but probiotic is really what happens when you've already sort of thrown your gut flora off, but the natural order of things is prebiotics, pre, and that's how God wants us to eat. He wants us to be more prebiotic, and guess what's prebiotic? A plant-based diet, because it requires fiber, fiber, okay, you with me? Now, and then the final one is DNA protection. That's easy. That's the coding in your body, just like in that, in that seed. It's the thing that says who you are, your eye color, your hair color, your height. Everything about you is there. So therefore, you have to protect it, right? Now, let's look at some types of seeds. Give me some examples. I want to get that from the sleepiest person here. What kind? Just tell me, no, just what are the types of seeds? 
black seeds, sunflower seeds, chia seeds. Yes, yeah, see, I knew you would go there. You're going just to seeds, right? But notice something with me. Notice that not just seeds are seeds, but nuts are seeds. Because if you take an almond, put it in water or and put it in soil, it will do what? It will sprout. Why? Because there's life in that thing. So therefore, using the definition we started with, it is a seed because it contains the genetic information to produce or to reproduce another one. Yes? Then you'll find also that beans are also seeds, right? Will beans sprout if you put them in water or in soil and give them the right conditions? Absolutely. All sounds like I am literally standing before you and describing the Adventist potluck meal. Is that true? Some beans, yeah, yeah, right? Some nuts, if you, you know, the kind of way I like to have my, when I say Adventist meal, I'm talking about, of course, haystacks, you knew it, haystacks, right? And if you think about what's in haystacks, it's the things that are all seeds. Now, for me personally, when I, I like, everyone likes cheese with their haystacks, yeah. Well, I like a cashew cheese. Cashew cheese, anybody ever had cashew cheese? That's one of the first things we make at our seminars. We always make a cashew cheese because it tastes just like a cheese sauce and it blows people away, right? So cashew cheese is what I like. So that's from a nut, right? And then you've got your beans. You can have your black beans or you can have your pinto beans, right? And then grains are also seeds. They will sprout. Grains, we're talking about what? Rice, that's the big obvious one, right? Quinoa is a grain, right? These things will sprice, I mean sprout. What would you say? Amaranth, yes, yes. All these are grains and they are also seeds because they contain life within themselves. And of course, seeds are seeds, right? So these are the types of seeds, right? Now, I want you to see this video. Sometimes I like to use a little bit of uh, videos in my presentations. Is that all right with you all? Because, you know, especially for those of you who, you know, sometimes when I go and share things, I'm so, so anti-health message. You know, that's why, you know, we have a full church, but then we have the health talks. It's going to say something that doesn't need to change, you know. But, so when people who come in, they're doubting, they're questioning whether this is true or not, right? Um, as I share it from science, they may say, well, I don't know about that, that's your science. But sometimes, you know, I definitely, because I'm also minister, I share from the gospel, right? O hoping to solidify the truth. Well, sometimes I reject that too. But for some reason, if I show it from the 6 o'clock news or from Dr. Oz, they say, well, then it must be true. So guess what? I'm going to give you all three. Science, good science that agrees with what I find in scripture, and then also the 6 o'clock news. Marcus, do we have audio? Thank you, sir. Well, this year the United Nations is highlighting the importance of a group of foods that can have big benefits for your health. They are called pulses. So what are they? You know that kind of pulse that's not a heartbeat. Yeah. Pulses are in the legume or the bean family, and they are the dried peas and beans like lentils, split peas, kidney beans, um, white beans, cannellini beans, and they're loaded with nutrition. They're packed with nutrients. They're sustainable. They help the environment. They help fix nitrogen in the soil, which helps the which helps the soil get healthy and the plants in the soil get healthier. They're very affordable and incredibly versatile. So internationally, they're a wonderful food to be adding and encouraging people to grow and consume, but also locally as well because they're highly available and we can buy them anywhere. They're called superfood. Yeah. Holly, what, what makes them so good for you? You know, one of, one of the very good things about the pulses is they have zero cholesterol, but even more importantly, they're very high in soluble fiber. Soluble fiber helps to control the cholesterol levels in our body and keep our blood sugar levels steady, which helps to prevent diabetes ultimately. They're very nutrient rich, right? They're high in vitamins and minerals, especially iron. Iron is one of the top vitamin deficiencies deficiencies worldwide. But what I like most about sort of emphasizing the pulses or this group of um, this group of uh, foods is that we talk a lot about having a plant-based diet. And that sort of seems abstract. When we say actually you can replace meat, you know, once a day, once a week with these 
high protein foods, that's a really a, a clear way to do it and, and something that can make a big difference for our and, health. And it's so easy. You can have hummus. You can throw it in soups. You can make yeah, any other examples. kinds of dips and sauces and tacos. You can even make cookies. So beans are great. Legumes. All right. Finally this morning, forget the crossword puzzles. A new... Now, what you hear in that, I heard a couple of things. First of all, pulses. Anybody familiar with this term? First of all, I'm, I'm, here's what I like to, what really captures my attention is when people are talking about something as if they've made a discovery. Wow! Did you hear about the new pulses? All the F FDA and the World Health Organization and the USDA, they've all started talking about pulses. It's this new food. It's a superfood. Dun, 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 dun. Right? This blows me away. I say, what? Have they not read? Have they not seen? I tell you what's old or what's new is really old, right? There's no new thing under the sun. We just think it is. So I love, it really gets my attention. It attracts me when I see something that someone thinks is a new thing. And I like what Solomon said. He said, see, there is no new thing. Call it not new. This is old. That's the first thing that got my attention. The second thing that got my attention is the fact that we are made in such a way that when we start to have issues with blood sugar, I, when we have um, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, when we have hypertension, when we have issues with cholesterol, there's a food that actually addresses it. Does this mean anything to you today? Oh, I want you to think about that. Because if Think about it. Okay, uh, some of you seem a bit unfazed. So when you're sort of unfazed, that also gets my attention. So now, can I just go back to the garden with you? Is that all right? If I were to go back to the garden in the beginning, and as I've already stated, that first God made a menu, and then he made a man. <laughs> he made a menu. Listen, 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 because he made all those things. He spoke them into existence. Loosen us grains of seed. Genesis 1 11. Well, we took a look at that toward the end. And then he designed a man. And then, because of the forethought, the forethinking of this designer, he decides in case my creation ever gets sick, I'm going to make sure that there's something called legumes. You can call them pulses, call them beans, whatever you want to call them. But I'm going to make something that when they consume them, it'll fix the problem. Why? Because the promise, there's a promise in the scriptures in Psalm 100 and verse 2 and 3. Really, 1, 2, and 3, if you like. And it says, do you mind if I quote it? I don't want to get all bible but we are in the church, aren't we? And I don't see a difference between healing and saving, if that's all right with you. It says, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now, we often look for a job with good benefits. When I was growing up, they always used to say, you better get a good job and have insurance because girls look for guys with benefits. <laughs> That's what I was told. So I always made sure. Does this job have benefits? Right? But the Bible says that God, he says, it says, forget not all of his benefits. God has benefits. See, he has an insurance plan. Oh, better than an insurance plan. It's called assurance. He's got health assurance. And his health assurance is found in the things that he designed from the very beginning. Does this make sense to you? Right? So it says, forget not all of his benefits. And then it has this wonderful, wonderful two phrases. It says, who forgives all your iniquities. And then who heals all your diseases. That's a promise, right? That's a promise that is like a seed. The word is a seed. And in that word is the promise that
that once you believe the, on the power of that seed, it sprouts into your good health. Did you hear what I just said? Do you believe it today? So, looking at this here. Looking right, well, this this, whoops. Looking at this, we see that there were three diets. Three diets. How many diets? Three diets in the Bible. Three diets. Right? There was the original diet. We talked about that last week. Genesis 1, 29. And it contained what? I want to make sure we're on the same page. What was in that diet? Help me out. So it seeds, yes. Fruit, yes. Nuts. And grace. It's the very thing that we're talking about, right? And so therefore, we see that pulses are a means that are seeds. And also in that video, it said that it brings back or it adds nitrogen or it stimulates the nitrogen in the soil. Did anybody hear that? So it's good for the environment. If you want to like enrich your soil. Anybody, any farmers here? Anybody growing their own food? He's a farmer. You're all right. All right. And you know that to have good soil, you have to have, you got to have nitrogen in it, right? Our atmosphere is mostly oxygen or nitrogen. Come on. Help me out here, man. You know the answers. Give them a chance. I'm trying to wake them up. <laughs> That's my friend. He knows the answers. He's a good farmer. So it's in the atmosphere. It's in the soil. But beans return nitrogen to the soil, right? Beans also are good for your heart. You've heard that before. Beans, beans, good for the Anyway, it's actually true. It's actually true. Let me show you that. Yes, it was. Now, second diet was, it did not, if you didn't know this, but the second diet did not include vegetables. It did not include collard greens. It did not include broccoli. It did not include kale. It was not, it was there, but it was for the animals. According to Genesis 128, and also Psalm 104 and verse 14. Right? It was for the service of man, and the grass was for the cattle. That's interesting to me because as you look at how the cattle live today, I'm not sure if you covered this, but it also would be good to mention it again if I did. But do you know how long a cow will last if it's fed what is typically given as its diet? That is soybeans and then the corn. Do you know how long it will live? Think about it. I'll give you a free book if you write this. Three years? Three years, three years. Anybody got anything better than that? 18 months. 18 months. Can anybody beat 18 months? 18 months. 18 months. Three years old. How, how many? Three months. Okay. It's low on the scale there. It's somewhere between what you said and what you said. A cattle will only live from nine months to about 16 months eating that diet. That diet is only designed to fatten it up and get it to the market. But it will die because that's not its diet. Now guess where we find out where the diet is from? I just told you. Psalm 104. Genesis 128. It says that the grass was for the cattle. The green herb was for them. That's what they're supposed to eat. But yet and still, we are leveling, we're leveling the rainforest throughout the Amazon so that we can put down more fields so that we can grow more things to feed cattle, a diet that is not for them. And that in and of itself is causing, is wreaking havoc on our environment, isn't it? Because it produces green gas emissions. See, we're out of balance. Friends, I'm here to tell you that this lecture, this talk, and this series is not just to come and get some more information. We need to hear something we haven't heard before and allow it to see the love of a designer, the love of a creator who wants to restore things. He had a plan. Would you agree with that? Great. And then the final diet was the emergency diet. First diet was fruits, nuts, grains, and seeds. Original diet. <clears throat> Second diet was the restoration diet. Oh, you don't want to miss my last lecture. College and Kale, love story. But greens came after 
Adam and Eve failed. And then the emergency diet, that comes in Genesis chapter 9, after all of the vegetation was destroyed. Yep, you got it. All right, so you're, you're clear on that. Now, last week I showed you this study. Going back, and just I like to reach back into the scriptures and see, does this agree with all the science that's going out there? And does the science agree with the Bible? So what we have here is a study that was done, the effect of a 21-day Daniel fast on metabolic and cardiovascular disease risk factors in men and women. <clears throat> So they wanted to know this diet that you find in the book of Daniel. Is there any merit in it? Does it make sense for the scientific mind? Can we study this and see? Yes, they did. And guess what they found out? Now, basically, it was a 21-day period that they did this study. It was devoid or without any animal products and preservatives, right? But it did include, notice, fruits, vegetables, whole grain, legumes, nuts, and seeds. Blow that up for you a little more. And you see there that this was a study that included what we're talking about today. The same things that actually comprehend what is a seed, right? Your whole grains, your legumes, nuts, I mean um, beans, your nuts, and seeds. And the conclusion was a 21-day period of modified dietary intake in accordance with the Daniel Pass, is what they called it, it, well, it was well tolerated by both men, men and women, so it was good for both men and women. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. It improved several risk factors for metabolic and cardiovascular disease. Now, notice this. This is powerful. Modification of dietary intake in accordance with the Daniel Fast is associated with improvement in selected biomarkers of antioxidant status and oxidative stress including metabolites. By the way, this is not my print. It's the Illumins today, so don't go away from me as saying, his slides were bad. It's the projector, okay? Including metabolites of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide. The same thing, or the same way that beans stimulate the soil, it stimulates nitric oxide in your arteries, and it actually helps you have a healthier heart. So no wonder it's good for your cardiovascular health. Make sense? So that's why Daniel said, in the very beginning of the book of Daniel, he says, look, please test your servant for 10 days and let them give, let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Now, vegetables is what is used in the New King James Version, but look what it says in the King James. Prove thy servants. I beseech thee, 10 days, and let them give us what? That's where it came from. Now, here's a quick, quick study in the, in the uh, derivation or the etymology of the word, right? Vegetable equals pulse. Pulse equals seeds. How do we know that? Because the word used there for pulse is the word zoroah. It's the Hebrew word zoroah, right? And that is, it came from the word zara, zara, right? And zara is the word for seed. And the one that's used in Genesis is zira, seeds. So in the beginning where God says, I have given you every herb that yields zara, <clears throat> right? Which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields zara. This shall be your food. Food. So much of the diet in the very beginning was a plant-based diet comprised mainly of seeds. I feel like I would just stop for a second there like I just said it was good. Let me talk about talk to you about the benefits. Now, here I talked about the fruit, right? Last week we talked about the fruit, but I put this up again because in this whole idea of I have given thee uh, herb yielding seed, I have given you trees that yield fruit which yields seeds. Here's the thing. 
mind blown. In that pronouncement of the dieful day, when it mentions fruit, the fruit does the same thing that the herb does. Let me take it back for a second. Notice, I have given you every herb that yields seed. But the herbs weren't to be consumed. It was what they did. It was like the verb. It's what it actually does. It provides the seed, right? Don't eat the herb, get it seed. Let's make sure we have an example of that. Wheat is a herb or something that comes from a plant but it yields seeds. Use the seeds and make yourself some bread. So in the beginning, don't eat the herb. Eat the seed because the seed has life and that's the most important thing. Are you following this? Oh, we're going to go somewhere with this, please. I need you to compartmentalize this and say, okay, he said that and he's going to add to that. So let me make sure I remember that. Write it down, put it in your brain somewhere. We're coming back to it. So if the herb... Its responsibility was to deliver the seed, which is on the face of all the earth. Then what was the responsibility of the tree whose fruit would yield seed? See, the answer is in the first thing that we read. The fruit is a delivery system for seeds. When you, anybody here like kiwi? When you eat a kiwi, do you, do you spit out all those seeds? No, no. Can you imagine what this, the fruit must have looked like in the Garden of Eden? With the seeds, they probably were talking seeds. I have a vivid imagination. Amazing seeds, right? That had life in them, and God wanted you to eat the seeds, right? You don't worry about those seeds. When you eat, how about strawberries? When you eat a strawberry, do you like to say, oh, this thing is covered with seeds. Let me cut them off. No, you just eat the seeds. Oh, this sounds like a wise God who has something in store for us to understand about seeds that maybe we've never fully understood. Yeah? But anyway, when you look at this, we talked about this last week. We saw the kiwis. Kiwis are amazing in terms of DNA repair, right? Just by eating those. So now, right, you're learning things that you can eat that actually make you healthy. Right? Use your technology. If I were you, I'd have my camera out. I'd be taking pictures of this stuff. I'd be heading to the grocery store after sunset, and I'd be buying these things. Right? Why? Because your body was designed to be fixed and repaired by them. Not by, forgive me, any medical people, but not by someone in a white coat. The human body was never designed to be managed by someone in a white coat. Thank God we have doctors that when we get sick and we need a pill, thank God we have doctors that when we have some trauma to the body, we can go get some painkillers and get ourselves stitched up and wrapped up. But in terms of just your everyday lifestyle, it's found in the garden, in the seed. Now, Again, continuing the seed idea, when you go to the children of Israel, remember them? They were, in the, they were in the wilderness and they were just going along for how many years? 40 years. They weren't supposed to take that long, but since they did, God said, I'm going to provide for you something in the wilderness. And it was described, it was manna. Remember that? It fell every day. And they described it, it was like or as coriander seed. Keeping this theme alive, even when you get to the book of Exodus and into the book of Numbers, it's still keeping the theme alive of the power of the seed. That something that would come down from heaven, it would resemble, it would be like, it would have the power of the seed. Yeah? I wonder why it's so important to the designer. Okay, let's look at some of the benefits of seed. Now, I shared this last week, and most of you knew this one. Right off the bat, you knew this. Let thy what? Food be thy medicine, and thy medicine be thy food. That's what I've been talking about, right? I believe. Can I just tell you this? Let me tell you what. You know what I believe? I believe 
whispering as if someone's listening in on us and might have some opposition to this. I don't know why. I believe that beings and seeds and things in the end are the original beings. That's that's because you spent too much time. I just came back from Los Angeles. You gotta forgive me. They are the original beings because they're medicine. For 2,500 years, a certain Chinese group of people used chickpeas for so many medicinal purposes. They said, we got to go study the chickpea. And they saw, wow, hypertension and all these things. Even topically, you can use it as a poultice. I'm telling you, there's medicine in that food. Right? But, that's right. Sprouted. Sprouts are the best, by the way. Most people didn't know about this thing. How about this one? Natural forces within us are the true healers of disease. What? Natural forces within us. We're talking about our angiogenesis. We're talking about our stem cells. We're talking about our immune system. We're talking about our DNA protection and what stimulates that. We're talking about our microbiome, our gut bacteria. I tell you, most of disease starts right here. And if you have a natural bar that's out of balance, you will get a disease. Everything right here. They didn't know this a few years ago. That the second largest cluster of neurons is in your gut. You know what a neuron is? That's a brain cell. You have brain cells in your tummy. <laughs> Did you know that? The second largest cluster of them is found here. That means your stomach, your gut, has cognitive abilities. That means it's thinking. It's connected to our brain by the vagus nerves through this hollow tube that goes from here all the way up to here. And there's a connection. What you eat matters. Your body actually tells you through this complex, very sophisticated system, it tells you when to eat, when to stop eating. Oftentimes, we don't listen to the second one. But the body will tell you when it's reached the point of satiety. It's just tired. Right? Now, ultimately, we all are seeds. Can I say that? I have three children. I just proved it. I got two boys, and I got a daughter. Son is 19. Son is 21. Okay. And I have a daughter who's in her 30s. They are my offspring, right? Well, my wife did all the work, but we reproduce children, right? And the forces within a seed can reproduce like that. A person is a seed because everything that's in you is also in the soil. NASA and all scientists did not believe for the many years that what Genesis said about the fact that man was made from the dust of the ground. How ridiculous is that? Until they began to look at the chemical composition of the elements of the, of the soil, and they said, wait a minute. What we see in the soil is also in the human body. Now we can go a little further. What we see in the soil is also in man, but it's also in the plants and in the seeds. It's a beautiful cycle. That's why perhaps God said, Thus you were made from, and thus you shall, so that I can continue the carbon cycle. Follow this? It's really amazing when you think about it. So natural forces in you are natural forces in the seed, and they agree with each other. Can two walk together unless they be 
Oh, you guys know your stuff. Okay, so we looked at this, that he's given us every herb, yielding seed. Now, that's what I just quoted from Genesis 2, 27, which says the Lord fought for man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, right? I tell you, it's just a good science book, this, 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 this Bible. It's amazing, right? It even tells you how to breathe. When you took your first breath, was it like this? Uh. Take a deep breath right now. Take a deep one. Oh, you take the deep breath through your nostrils so that you purify the air. That's God's design. And then you let out the cleansing, or the cleansing out through your mouth. That's what the Bible says. Through the nostrils. That's how we breathe. How we take deep inspirations of air. Now, skipping over this, we looked at this last week. We looked at the whole DNA, right? The double helix. And this is what we're made of, basically. We are polysaccharides, many sugars. We are proteins, and we are minerals. People often say, hey, how do you get your protein? Anybody ever hear that? If you happen to be a vegan or a vegetarian, how do you get your protein, brother? How do you get your protein, sister? Right? But no one ever goes to the gorilla or the elephant or the, I saw the other day, on social media, a rhinoceros that literally was taking a car and would just flip it with his head and the whole car would spin over. I couldn't believe it. I said, whoa, just with a slight lift of his head and the entire car would flip. There were some people getting a little too close with the camera going in on a safari. This is an animal that only eats plants. Where do you get your protein? The problem is not protein, it's minerals. That's what is the glue that holds the rung of the ladder together with the sides, right? Now, I've given you, let's bring this home. I have given you nuts and seeds, right? Here's some science talking about the benefits. Shared this last week, but I'm glad that if you weren't here last week, oh, you should see this. Get out your cameras. Take a picture. And you'll actually live at least two years longer just by doing this. And we looked at eating one handful of nuts five or more days a week will extend your life span by at least two years. Anybody want to live an extra two years? Some of you are just not excited about life. You want to have a talk? You want to have a conversation about it? We can talk. We can chat. What's going on with you? Nobody wants to live anymore. <laughs> but he said, occupy until I come. <laughs> Can't just go out and fall out dead, eating bad. That's what the heathens do. We just eat, dr eat, drink, and be merry. He says that enough times, right? That's not what we're to do. We're to eat not for drunkenness, but for strength so that we can do things, right? So here we find from this research from 2001, it shows that by eating a handful of nuts, and we made sure that we were clear last week that a handful of nuts is about a quarter cup of nuts, and they should not be roasted. Sorry, they should not kill the enzymes. They become useless to you. They need to be raw. Even better if they're sprouted. You can buy them like that now, pre-sprouted. Just before they sprout, you can buy them right then. Easier to digest. They're more bioavailable to you, right? So a handful, quarter cup, like this. Remember that, Galen, last week? And you held out your fist like this. But then we said what? Closed fist, and what else? Turned upside down. Anything that falls out, you don't eat. It's a good fat, but it's a fat nonetheless, right? But watch the next one. Look at the next slide. Not only do they add years to your life, two years. How many of you know what telomeres are? Telomeres. Oh, you have come to the right seminar. You need to know about telomeres. You need to know about telomeres. Marcus, up there, you need to know about telomeres. It's amazing. It's amazing science. And what they have found is that, see these right here? These little caps right here? That's a chromosome, right? And you all know about chromosomes. You remember that from biology? Yeah? Chromosome has these little caps. They're 
They're equivalent to the caps on your shoelaces. And if you don't have them there, what happens to the shoelaces? They become to be, they begin to fray and to tear, right? That's what happens to your telomeres. Telomeres are the perfect predictor of your longevity. And from the moment you are born or even conceived, as soon as the cells begin to divide, they begin to get shorter and shorter. Oh, friends, I hope you hear something here. Listen, do it again. From the time that the cells begin to divide, the telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter throughout your life. And when they get down to the base, base level or size, you die. This reminds me that when God says, by dying you shall die, it wasn't to be immediate. He was he literally saying, there's something in you that as soon as you are conceived, you'll start the process of dying. I don't tell you that to take away your hope. I'm giving you the reality of the word, but I'm going to give you some hope. Here's the hope in the science. Notice this. They did a study, Brigham Young University, 5,000, 5, rather, 582 men and women between 20 and 84 years. This was a part of the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, and they wanted to know how much and how often they ate nuts and seeds, right? And guess what they found? For every 10 grams per day, the telomeres were 8.5 units longer over the course of a year. That's why they add two years to your life. Because you actually can eat seeds and nuts and start the process of going younger. <laughs> I told you I was going to give you hope. Nuts will help you to live longer. It will actually help the telomeres. Oh, they did a study also with people who don't do like, you know, the kind of care that you would have like a special needs person, right? They found that they have, because it's a stressful job, they have the shortest telomeres of anybody. So stress actually shortens your telomeres and therefore shortens your life, right? But if you have a job like that, guess what you're going to do? Grab yourself a handful of nuts, close your fist, shake off the excess, and then eat them without salt, without being roasted, without caramel or honey or anything like that. Just raw nuts and seeds. Are you all with me? All right. How about this? Harvard, Harvard Medical School, they did a multi-center study, 826 patients. Um, these were people who had stage 3 colon cancer, right? They gave them two servings of tree nuts. That's your walnuts. That's your cashews. That's your pecans. All that, right? Gave them two servings of tree nuts per week. And they saw a 57% reduction in their risk of death. Based on these were people taking chemotherapy. But nuts helped them. That's a, tr that's a traumatic and very stressful thing to go through. First of all, the bad news of having cancer. But then also the chemo begins to wipe out your good cells as well as the bad. But nuts, according to this study from the Journal of Clinical Oncology, it shows that if you eat nuts while you're going through it, now this is some information that you can use, not just for yourself, but you can tell somebody, oh, you're going through chemotherapy? You should look at that research. This could help you live beyond that five years that often we celebrate. Huh? Make sense? I tell you, we have the solution. How about this? People who eat nuts and seeds tend to not only live longer, but also suffer fewer deaths from cancer, from heart disease, and from upper respiratory disease. Now, those are your number one, number two, and number three killers. Not in that order, because heart disease is number one, cancer is number two, and respiratory disease is number three, although cancer is threatening to overtake heart disease. Now, let me give you some good news. Here's the research. 2013, 2015, it says you eat nuts, same way, you'll not only live longer, but you'll suffer from fewer diseases. That's good news. Is that good news, somebody? Oh, I'll tell you what. All right, keep going. Heart disease. I just mentioned heart disease. I'm going to focus on that one. Here's some studies for you. 
He says, I've given you tomatoes. This is amazing stuff. You know, platelets, blood platelets, they're the things that cause heart attack and strokes in the first place, right? Notice this. Tomatoes are protective against heart attacks. One of the reasons is because of the yellow fluid which surrounds the seeds. Right? The fluid concentrates a compound that suppresses platelet activation because that's what triggers the blood clots that cause heart attacks and strokes. Don't throw away the seeds when you have that salad from the tomato. Same thing. It's like the fruit. It's a delivery system for the seeds, right? Beans and seeds. Now, this study was a physician's health study. It took 7,447 people in Spain, pretty much healthy, right? But nonetheless, they were at risk for cardiovascular disease because of their diet. Got me? They gave them three servings of nuts per week, and it reduced by 39% their risk of mortality, of death. Again, nuts and seeds, right? Can I tell you a story about Mr. Bean as we get ready to do this? Mr. Bean, we call him Mr. Bean because I have a friend who uh, he's on my television show. He's a doctor. He's a, he is the uh, chief medical director in the cardiology department at White Memorial Hospital in California. His name is Dr. Schubert Palmer. He's on my show. We did a, uh, one of my favorite uh, episodes of From Sickness to Health, having him on there. If you ever get a chance, it's on YouTube. Watch it. You'll be blessed by it. Um, it's called When Hearts Attack. We show how hearts don't attack you. You attack your heart. Um, your heart actually loves you. It keeps you living. Anyway, he tells the story of Mr. B. This was a Mexican gentleman living there in Los Angeles, and he ate whatever he wanted. I mean, whatever he wanted. And he got so bad, he got so bad, Philip, that this man, his heart was so weak and damaged the arteries and so forth that he literally could not walk from his bed when he got up in the morning to his bathroom, which is right there, master bath, in the master bedroom. Couldn't walk to it without taking nitroglycerin. Right? Couldn't do it. So he came into to, to Dr. Palmer and he said, look, I, you know, I feel like I'm constantly about to have a heart attack. He had had various procedures and so forth, but he would not change his diet. No matter what, no matter how life-threatening it was, he would not change. Right? So he said, I just need to ask you a, a very direct question, Dr. Palmer. He says, am I going to die? And Dr. Palmer is a lovely man, but he's a very strict man. He said, doctor, I'm going to have to do something. He looked in the eyes and said, I'm sorry. You should go home to Mexico and get your affairs in order in order that you have a very, very limited time. And Dr. Palmer looked at him. Of course, this man was devastated by this news. He wasn't that old either. He wasn't yet 40 years of age. He goes to Mexico to do exactly that. He gets down to Mexico, and he has a very poor family. You know, in Los Angeles, he's eating high on the hog. He's eating everything. He gets down to Mexico, he starts working in the garden. He starts eating beans every single day because that's all they had. They couldn't afford the occasional chicken. He just had beans every day. Every day. Every day. Several years go by. In walks Mr. Bean into Dr. Palmer's office. And I love to hear him tell the story because he was shocked. He said, what are you doing here? I thought you were dead. <laughs> Mr. Bean tells him the story of how he went home and his family was so poor there, he went to get his affairs in order and all he could eat was beans, beans, beans. And the beans restored his heart. And the beans is a seed, isn't it? Nuts and seeds, wonderful things. We talked about that last week, but I want to just focus here on the Brazil nuts. We talked about this last week, but you should know about this if you are taking statin drugs or have high cholesterol. According to this study, you take four Brazil nuts, it lowers your LDL cholesterol by nine, oh, I'm sorry, 20 points in nine hours. After eating a single serving, how many of you, after last week, went out and purchased yourselves some Brazil nuts? Aha! Somebody's learning. Oh, that does my heart well to know that somebody's benefiting. 
by just eating Brazil nuts. And as I said last week, there are no Brazil nut commercials. But you will find all types of drugs like Lipitor, Lipitor, that is constantly being thrown at you, but yet they don't perform better than Brazil nuts in any clinical trial study. That's why I said the pill is a counterfeit. The Brazil nut is the original gangster. Cancer. Cancer. What about this study? Cancer prevention. That was the second leading cause. But how do nuts affect those? Cancer. It was a study, a big one too, 478,000 people, women consuming one and a half servings of nuts and seeds per day. Two servings of tree nuts per day. Right? 31% reduced risk of cancer. How about this one? University of Missouri and Iowa State. The goal was to activate tumor suppressor gene. Can you believe that? In your body is a gene. Its, its total role is to suppress cancer. And there are foods that will stimulate that gene. This is what they call epigenetics. Epigenetics is, you know, that's something that was made popular by uh, T. Colin Campbell when he looked at the fact that if you use casein, that's in the dairy products, that's a protein in the cheese and things like that. And when you put it in your body, like a light switch, it turns cancer on. When you take it out of the diet, it turns cancer off. It's like a light switch. And this is how, you know, this whole idea, not just that, but the idea of epigenetics came into to be. That is... You can look at certain foods that will actually turn things on. So your genes are not your fate. 75%, listen, 75% of what happens to us in terms of chronic lifestyle diseases is our own choice, as we started from that statement from Dr. Baxter Montgomery. It's your choice. You can turn cancer on, but we're not here to do that, are we? We're here to turn it off. Therefore, in this study, 30, 34 healthy women, it was a prospective, randomized, double-blind clinical trial, and they took high doses of and low doses of soy bioactive two times a day. Um, isoflavones, that was the bioactive that's found in soy. And by the way, this comes up all the time, wherever I go. Our, is soy good? I hear this soy causes breast cancer. Soy, soy, soy. Should I stop eating soy? You hear this? Can I just answer it? based on the knowledge and the research that's available? It's very simple. We need to eat as closely from the garden as possible. Whole foods, plant-based. Taking it directly in its natural state, not denatured. The thing that people worry about is the phytoplant estrogen that's found in soil. It mimics estrogen and it can cause things to grow. That's the argument. On some levels, that could be true if you are battling uh, breast cancer. But the soy that this study looked at, it's looking at the what? Edamame. That's in its whole state. It has not been denatured. Soy is a powerful seed. So, what am I saying to you? We tend to eat too much soy that's processed. All your vegetarian restaurants are just, boom, it's better than meat. That's true, but it's still processed. So, again, eat as closely from the hand of God as possible. Does that make sense? That's what this study is based on. And what did they find out? The low dose was the equivalent of one to two cups of edamame beans. High doses was four cups. Even low doses was able to suppress genes and turn them on to fight cancer. University of Toronto, looking at prostate cancer for men, 1,253 men from Toronto and Quebec, evaluated intake of nuts, beans, and seeds. One serving of nuts and beans, was about two tablespoons per day, 31% reduced risk of prostate cancer. Right? So I always like to end with, I have not given you this. God has not given us something that has no life. Well, I just go to the basic now. For the last few minutes, I've been sharing with you life found in a seed. 
this was God's intent. And if you understand it from this perspective, you understand that our diet should be a diet of life, not of death. Human body was never to be a graveyard for dead food. There's no life in this food. There's not a lot of water in it. There's no fiber in it. So it doesn't feed the gut, doesn't stimulate the DNA, doesn't stimulate angiogenesis, doesn't stimulate even, at least not in any significant way, stem cell activation. Eat what you want, though. I'm not telling you what to eat. I'm letting you know that this, if you want to walk in an agreement with the one who designed you, then you have to look at what is designed and the purpose of that design was. It was a diet of life. One of my favorite quotations is found in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 28. It says, in the way of righteousness is life, and in the pathway thereof there is no death. I've placed before you life and death. Choose life. That's what he says. Okay, I don't know what happened here. But he got cut off somehow. Anyway. Um, oh, it probably was in the transfer because I sent it as an email. All right. I close with this. Now, I don't agree with this guy, um, Lowen Von Lee. I don't agree with him. He's into some things that are not the things that I believe in. But I believe in the watermelon principle. Uh, eat the watermelons without the seeds, right? But he says something profound here. And I thought it set up very nicely my conclusion. He says, just as we need to treasure the physical seeds that remain, valuing life's diversity, so do we need to remember the stories of seeds. Ah. To keep alive this inner mystery of life and rebirth, of transformation in the darkness. Stories of seeds are, are in our sacred texts. In the Gospel of St. John, this is what he says, in the Gospel of St. John, there is the simple image of, of a grain of wheat falling into the ground and through its death bringing forth much fruit. Oh, isn't that beautiful? He goes on. He says, without such stories and their images, our souls are not nourished and we forget our connection to the earth and its rhythms and the seasons of our own soul. I didn't have a problem with any of this. We remain stranded in the surface masculine world of science and technology, starved of an inner nourishment essential to our well-being and wholeness. I thought that was absolutely profound, especially in light of my conclusion that I want to share with you. Now, notice this. We've been talking here about the seed, right? And how the designer of the body designed the menu, right? Then we talked about the fact that the seed sprouts and it Works does its work. Most of its work in darkness. In the darkness of the soul. It's like a mystery. It's down there doing its thing and out comes life. Right? We talked about the fact that it becomes a tree from which we can pluck a piece of fruit. Oh, that's really messed up. I can't even see the apples, man. It has apples on it. Now, you'll find that we talked about it in Genesis 1, 11 and Genesis 1, 29. The herb yielding seed we talked about, whose seed is in itself. To you it shall be for food. Right? This section I've said to you really shows us our greatest need for seed. And if you miss the parallel, you miss all of the glory. You miss all of the beauty. The diet that was given was just a day-to-day -day practice for something much greater, something much more beautiful. There's another seed. It comes shortly after that. You'll find it in Genesis 3, 15, in Galatians 3, 16. It says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Wow! The promise of a Savior the promise of a Savior was communicated and described as a seed. But not only that, this seed would have such power that he would defeat the seed of the dragon. What a powerful story in and of itself, isn't it? 
And then Galatians, in case we weren't clear, Galatians 3.16 says, And to thy seed, which is Christ. He makes it very clear, Paul does. He says, he is our seed. So, if we were to look at this process of going from a seed to a sprout, to a tree, and then bearing fruit, could we find that in the promise of a Savior? Could we find that in the promise of a deliverer? Could we find that in the love that was promised that would come? Could we find it? Yes, in the most beautiful way where it is borne out in Scripture. You find there in Isaiah 53 it says, and for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And all the research, all the science shows now that even better than the seeds and even better than the full collard greens or the broccoli are the sprouts when they're young and tender. How does God allow himself, first of all, to be called a seed, and then second of all, to be called a little tender plant? That's risky, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Ephesians 6.19 and Romans 16.25, it talks about the fact that this remained a mystery. It took place in darkness. It was something that was not very well understood for centuries. And then when he comes, they said, ah, oh. it was John the Baptist who stood on the banks of the Jordan River. He says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But now, I think that John were here, and Jesus came, he would say, Behold, the seed that heals your body, that takes away your sickness, because he does both. He takes away your sickness and your sin. And he's described as a tender plant. And then now, continuing now with the analogy in Mark 4.30, it says, What is the kingdom of heaven like? It's like a mustard seed, which when it is sown, on the ground is smaller than all the seeds on earth. The smallest one, but then it says it becomes the greatest one in the garden. And it grows and it's bigger than all the others. John 12, 23 says, this one that the gentleman was referencing, he says, but if that seed, that wheat seed, if it doesn't die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it does what? It brings forth much fruit. It brings forth much fruit. It must die. This was a picture of the death of Christ, who would be the seed for us. We can't talk about the seed without talking about the original seed. That's why I bring it up. I'm not trying to get all pushy with religion, but I'm just showing you what where it all comes from. I like looking at origins. I like looking at where it all comes from. As you go and you begin to partake of some seeds and some nuts and some grains, every time you do, you must remember that just like it says here, unless that wheat seed goes in the ground and dies, you can't get bread. I know you like bread. I like bread. But in order to make bread, you got to take that wheat berry and you got to grind it to powder. You got to grind it. You gotta bust it up. You gotta bruise it. You gotta beat it up. It doesn't become bread otherwise. You have to bruise it. This is what the picture of the gospel is in us. That's why he uses the wheat juice himself as an example. I don't know how it happens. This is amazing storytelling from the from the Bible. I don't know. That Genesis 3.15 says he's going to be a seed. And that he would be a tender plant. And the fact that years before, hundreds of years before it happens, it says that he's going to come to Bethlehem. Oh, we'll be talking about that in a few months as the kids and the children are singing songs. But I want you to remember this season. That Bethlehem also has a significance for the seed. Because Bethlehem means the bread basket bread basket. The bread, the seed for bread, comes to the place where he would allow himself to be beaten and bruised and become bread to feed. There's something to this, isn't there? Here's what's to it. 
as you look at it here, he came as that little baby in the manger. Yeah. And there he was working in silence and darkness in the, his father's carpentry shop. Then believe it or not, that little seed, that little mustard seed, he becomes, see, so small, but yet he's greater than all the other seeds. So much so that he goes into the temple and he starts teaching them. 